So let's start our adventure talking about linear regression. So remember the main ideas, we have one output, we have different inputs, and we want to try to distinguish between the signal and the noise. In this case, we are going to do the following assumptions. We are going to assume that all the input variables are not related and not coupled between them. They are not interacting. So we're going to call that property a linearity and additivity. So we're going to assume that y depends linearly on x and not x1, x squared, for instance, and we are doing just linear combinations of the inputs. We're going to call hat y the prediction, so the signal is going to be everything in, in a perfect world, how would be this correlation or this combination of the inputs. Regarding the noise, we're going to do the following assumptions. We're going to assume that the, re the residual, the, the difference between the real value and the prediction is uncorrelated throughout the, the chart. The second uh, assumption is that the, the error is distributed normally, so there's a Gaussian distribution of the, dis of the errors around this uh, straight line. And the other concept, and this is harder to grasp, we're going to call that hemostelasticity. Uh, it is a fancy word to say that we are not going to allow these sort of situations in which in, in one part of the plot we have a lot of variance, in another part of the plot there is little or no variance. In this case you can see that this is more or less fulfilling that condition, so the thickness of this kind of banana shape distribution is more or less the same in all of the all other parts of the plot. Okay, we're going to talk the input variables simply regressors, and there's an interesting property of linear regression is that you take the partial derivative of the output with respect to each of the inputs, so leaving the other one constant, you're going to obtain just uh, the parameter that we're multiplying that variable. So in this case, if you take the partial derivative of y with respect to x1, this is going to give us beta1. So the betas, the weights or coefficients of the regression are directly the sensitivity. So a very low cost way to do sensitivity analysis is simply using linear regression. Okay, the central idea in linear regression is try to find a line that is closer to the data. You can unload all the code in, in from GitHub, you can see the link in the description. So let's take this very simple data set and forget about the line for a moment. So here we have this y, which is the output, and x, which is the input. And without the line, we can see clearly that the larger x, the larger is y. So this is a good candidate for trying to draw this line that is closer to the data. But what does closer mean in this context? So in a sense, closer means that overall the, the, the mean distance between the observations and the straight line is minimum. So if you remember, we discussed this sort of things when we talk about gradient descent, and you can you can stop the video and go to that video and check that description. But, but the idea is, let's define the residual. The residual is basically the distance between the observed data point, this is the one in the data set, and the function that I want to fit. In this case, we are, I'm going to, to try to fit a linear, uh, linear line. Sometimes we are, over, we are overestimating and we sometimes we are underestimating. So we are going to square this function in order to remove the sign. So the target of this linear regression is try to find the straight line that minimizes this. So let's plot the data again and then let's do some brute force experiments. So I'm going to sample different values of the slope, different values of the intercept. I'm going to compute the estimated value according to this b and this a, and I'm going to compute the sum of the residuals, the residuals square. If you take a, a look at this table, you can see that sometimes the error is huge, sometimes it's a small, and, and this is the smallest value ever. So what's the difference between the green and the red? So if you take a look at the green, you can see that the trend is more or less captured by this line, so the larger x1, the larger is y, but there is something f missing here, so it looks like this red line, sorry, this green line is underestimating some of the points. What if we try to leave 50% above and 50% below, like the blue line? Okay, this is doing a better job in that regard, but it's not capturing the trend that well. So these points are too far away, and also these points, despite the fact that these points are better captured. So if you take a look at the minimum, it corresponds to this function. So this is a compromise between being too far and also having the right trend. So why it is called least squares, and, and remember the square has to do with this. Least squares is the one which is minimizing the distance. So the distance is something that is uh, has the same sign if you are above or you are below. And the red line is the one that overall is reducing these sticks from the observations to the line. You can compute the, the coefficients exactly, so if you plug this uh, hat y here and you take the partial derivative of this function, with respect to B and A, you can compute it, but R is going to do that for us. 
There is an interesting consequence of this formula. So if you plug this, this linear function for all the observations in the table, you could say that the predicted value for y1 will be something like b times x1 plus a and then some error. But we add all this as we are sometimes errors above the line and sometimes we have errors below the line. The sum of all these errors of these residuals are going to be zero. So in a sense, the, the linear line that we are fitting crosses the point the mean value of x and mean value of y. And this is an interesting consequence because when you draw this uh, straight line, one of the points is going to be the mean value of x versus the mean value of y. Okay, let's do another example. So let's take information about body mass index. So this is body fat percentage and this is body mass index. And we're going to use R to understand this. So in, in R, the fitting is doing with this LM function. And the syntax is very simple. So let's take the variable that we are going to predict. This is the output. Let's use this tilde, and then the input is this BMI, and this is the name of the data set. You can again, you can download these examples from the script. And here we have a summary of the call. This is the, a summary of the residuals, and as you can see here, the median is around zero. And we have a, a lot of values below, in negative values, and a lot of the residuals are above. And this is the interpretation. So basically, this is a straight line. So this is minus 28, this is the intercept, and this is 1. So what's the interpretation of this? Minus 28 would mean that people with zero body mass index, which is, is crazy because the, that would mean that they have zero weight, has minus 28 uh, body fat percentage. So sometimes the intercept is not interpretable. So this depends on the units and the scale. So in most of the cases, I'm going to skip the interpretation of that. And what about the intercept, sorry, the slope? This is more interesting. This means that every point in BMI that you increase that represents 2% increase in body fat. R also provides additional information. Here is the most important information. You can see here R squared, and I'm going to explain that later. The p-value, which is a measure of how significant is, is this fit. Okay, so one interesting thing that we have to do is not just leaving, so not, not just estimating the parameters, but try to see how close is the model, how good is the model. So there are different metrics. The most important one, and all of the metrics are, are related to this one, is called the sum of square errors, or sometimes the residual sum of squares. And as you can see by the name, this is basically summing all the differences between the real value in the data set and the estimated value according to our model. The mean square error is this divided by n, and the root mean square error is the square root of the, the one before. Sometimes there are a lot of parameters and we have to correct for the number of parameters because if you increase the number of inputs, maybe you are getting a better, a better estimate, but this is kind of cheating because you're not taking into account that with more information, the, the models could be better, but not because you are capturing better the information, but because you are using just more regressors. So later we're going to relate RSS with this parameter that we've seen before, this R squared, which is a kind of summary of how good is our model, but let's stop it here.